Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Tim Poe. I'm Director of Telehealth with the UNC Cancer Network. Thank you so much for being with us today. We have a presentation called Melanoma, Early Detection and Therapeutic Progress with Dr. David Alilla and Andrea Sacconi snyder uh, we're, and we're so glad to have both of them with us today. Before we get started, just a few preliminaries. Email, if you need to reach us for any reason, unccn at unc.edu. You can also call or text us at 919-445-1000. Uh, we'll talk about Poll Everywhere in just a minute. We're on the web at unccn.org. We're on Facebook. We're on Twitter. We're on YouTube. You can find us all sorts of places, and we hope that you do. Over 185 different uh, previous lectures recorded there and lots of information about, about the events coming up this year. All right. With that in mind, uh, I want to start you off by thinking about Poll Everywhere, and this is where we uh, provide opportunities for you to give us feedback, let us know who you are, and then ask questions a little later in the presentation. So uh, what you're going to do is if you have a computer and you want to go ahead and go to pollev, dot -E com slash UNCCN, you can go ahead and answer questions, ask questions there. Uh, you can also just text the number... 22333, and once you do that, you're going to put in UNCCN. That joins you. You'll get a little confirmation that you're joined to today's poll everywhere, and then you can go ahead and answer questions. Our first question is going to be, which of the following best describes you? Are you uh, a community member, patient, caregiver, interested individual? B, a medical professional, physician, nurse, etc. C, a cosmetic arts professional, a cosmetologist or esthetician, or D, other? So be thinking about that, and in just a moment we'll go ahead and, and give you a chance to actually answer that, then ask questions a little bit later. We have with us uh, David Olilla, MD, and he is the James and Jesse Millis Distinguished Professor at the Department of Surgery at UNC Chapel Hill and serves as the director, as the associate director of the North Carolina Cancer Hospital. He is the surgical director for both the Multidisciplinary Breast Program and Multidisciplinary Melanoma Program at the UNC Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center. Dr. Olilla has a 17-year history as a melanoma clinical trialist, including immunotherapy trials and targeted therapy trials. Dr. Olilla has been invited to make presentations both nationally and internationally on melanoma and breast cancer care and treatment. Let me go ahead and uh, change the camera here so we can get a view of all of us. And there we go. It's better. Uh, we also have with us Andrea Sacconi Snyder. And am I pronouncing that correctly? That little yeah, name? I yeah. got it. Good. <laughs> <laughs> I was hoping. Um, Andrea Sacconi Snyder is a salon owner, hairstylist of 26 years, and life coach. She founded the Flow Beauty Project in 2016, which empowers and inspires salon professionals and others to live healthy, balanced lives inside of the salon and beyond. Andrea recently published her first book, Congratulations. Yeah. Titled The Mindful Beauty Maker's Little Book of Wisdom. It's a self development guide for salon and spa professionals and their clients. She's worked with, uh, with UNC and Dr. Ovilla in the past on programs educating salon professionals in the area of early detection of skin cancer. So welcome to both of you. Glad to have you here. Thanks. I want to remind our guests that uh, if you are a cosmetologist or esthetician, you, we have an uh, opportunity for you to get continuing education credit. And so be sure at the end of this presentation to uh, take care of the evaluation that you received through email, and then that certificate will be available to you. And, of course, we hope that everyone uh, fills out an evaluation. That Those are always helpful to us. Uh, so, uh, before we go any further, I, I think the two of you wanted to talk a little bit about why we're here today. Right. So, um, first of all, thank you for taking time out of your busy day to, to join us. Um, Andrea and I have uh, been very thoughtful in this. This is not the first time that we've gotten together to do this. And so, there may be those of you in the audience that haven't been with a, a, a mixture of caregivers or community um, providers or um, stylists, beauticians. So this is going to be a little bit of a unique presentation, uh, especially from my standpoint, because we're really trying to branch out to make sure that this kind of a message uh, crosses disciplines. Andre? Yeah, so David and I have um, 
Thank you for being here, first of all, taking time out of your busy schedules for this important message. But um, I just wanted to give you a little background on Dr. Alila, a.k.a. David, and I. Um, he's been a, style, uh, a client of mine for the last probably 17 years. And so this um, subject matter came about pretty organically as we were discussing his profession in the chair. Um, and you know, coming in and him saying that it's been another stylus detected melanoma today that he did surgery on. And so as we started talking, we thought, hey, you know, it's such an important thing and stylists have such a great view of their clients. Let's get together and try to educate uh, the industry on how to um, help our clients be on the chair. So that's why we're here today and we're going to go a little bit more in depth on why that's such a great pairing. And um, I think David has some slides to show you first. All right, great. Well, we're so glad that, that uh, both of you are here today. I did want to take a look at our poll. So it looks like we've got about 20% community members, uh, about 40% medical professionals, about 20% uh, cosmetologists, estheticians, and about 20% others. So it gives you a little bit of an idea of the audience we have with us. And thank you so much to our audience for being here. I'll go ahead and advance this slide one more and pass this over to you. Right, thank you. And here's the mouse in case you would like to uh, use that cursor at all. Thank you. So I, th I think to, to frame this um, and to g highlight what we want to get across today, um, the first part of this um, is skin cancer awareness and education. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about early detection, Andrea is going to get into um, more nuts and bolts of what she sees um, the stylist being able to do um, and um, giving a technique to do that. The second part of this is really a, a completely different view, um, and this is really talking about therapeutic progress in this disease. Um, we have made incredible strides in melanoma in the last seven years, and so highlighting that therapeutic progress, talking a little bit more in detail about mechanism, about some of these drugs that have now found their way into lung cancer, urothelial cancers, et cetera. Um, so this is really two different parts to the talk today. Um, I think I'd be remiss unless people really understood the magnitude of this problem. Um, and you, you can imagine you know, looking at the far left-hand side, you see when we are this agricultural industry in the United States back in the 1930s, and, you know, melanoma is basically uh, an uncommon disease. And you fast forward to um, the movement to, to being outside and that brown is beautiful mantra, and you see this just incredible epidemic rise in the diagnosis of melanoma. The, the CDC estimates that by 2025, one in 55 uh, U.S. people will be diagnosed with melanoma in their lifetime. So I've got some, you know, slides to bring this kind of a message home. And so if you can't read the cartoon, um, uh, using uh, sunscreen, it says future skin, skin cancer victim. And so it's a behavioral thing that seems to um, invaded our society when if you contrast this to, you know, even Elizabethan England or other times, you know, having brown skin meant you were a laborer. And that was actually looked at as a bad thing. Whereas now in society, we for whatever reason, have deemed having dark skin is a positive. But it even gets worse, right? We have one of the worst um, and poorly regulated industries around, the tanning bed industry. Um, and it took a long time, but finally, finally, North Carolina made tanning beds illegal for minors. Um, and this happened in October of 2015. Uh, but... Um, this is an industry, the data is so incredibly sound that tanning bed use 
causes skin cancer. Tanning bed use causes melanoma. So we're taking um, two different things, natural sunlight and then artificial UV rays and actually causing skin cancers. Maybe there's extra societal pressure, right? So I'm not a country music fan, and so for those of you that um, think that I am so in touch, I'm not. Um, but this is a, a um, Facebook post that Miranda Lambert made before um, a 2012 um, concert um, a tour she was making. She took incredible backlash from this Facebook post because of people who knew she has you know, a prominence in society and she's able to send a message to young, particularly young females, that that may work. Um, so there's societal pressures out there. I'm not a big fan, but, you know, reality TV shows. They actually, on the Jersey Shore, parlayed this into actual lines of tanning beds. So we have lots of factors going on, not just that we decide to be a more recreational society and being outside, but there are people and there are segments of our population that actually see this as it's no big deal. You know, I'm a 20-something, it won't get me. So I want to again highlight that this is the fastest growing cancer in incidence, meaning number per year, of any other tumor. And this it has no signs of plateauing, no signs at all. And so for us, Andre and myself, we are trying to ask how, how can we make an impact? And the easiest way to think of this, and I'll show you some slides when it's my turn to, to speak again, that the earlier you detect the melanoma, the better the prognosis. So why not use people that are seeing people on a regular basis, that you can detect change, and they can bring this to the attention of a qualified healthcare professional. And so for this talk, you know, we're going to use the word stylist over and over, but you can imagine you have the word massage therapist. You can imagine you have the word dental hygienist. Anyone that has access to an, an area of skin on a client over and over, that's someone who can be noticing change and leading to early detection. So with that brief introduction, I'm going to turn this over to Andrea and let her discuss what she's been working on. Okay, David, thank you. Um, I loved some of those slides. Um, Jersey Shore, that brought back some memories. Um, I We went over earlier um, a little bit about how David and I came to be here today, and um, that's pretty much where I'd like to start. Um, you know, we as estheticians, stylists, cosmetologists, massage therapists, personal trainers even, um, healthcare providers that are, are often not the ones you would think that would be looking for, for melanomas like podiatrists and such, um, nail care professionals. We all have a really great opportunity to serve our clientele beyond what we are paid to do. And I think a responsibility to some, to some level to be able to do that. So that's what this education is for today. Um, there's a few things that um, healthcare providers and beauty professionals have in common and uh, just fun facts. Um, if you didn't know, that the um, State Board of uh, Cosmetology is a regulated um, uh, cosmetologists need to be regulated by the state. Uh, they take practical and written examinations. They're in school for sometimes over a year, depending on the state. 
And um, in order to get their license, they need to pass the state and written exam. Um, fun fact, the, the, the slide you're seeing above is not a group of uh, nurses or doctors or surgeons. It is a group of estheticians or skin um, care professionals, potentially cosmetologists. And uh, the, the people in the scrubs below are a group of medical professionals, but we happen to wear the same type of thing when we're in training. Um, just moving on. So, you know, to be in the beauty profession, it means that we care about people. We are people people, um, as with the medical profession. And, you know, so that also brings with it uh, the responsibility. And I think the thing that the license provides us um, is the ability to touch people. Uh, after just a few minutes in the chair with the stylist, um, we're in someone's personal space, as is with a, a healthcare provider. And I think, again, with that comes responsibility. Um, I think that because we are given that license to touch, and only a handful of professions are, our clientele tends to trust us. They really, um, in a matter of minutes, um, just give it over to us and trust us. And um, I think it's a, a really great thing for us to take this into consideration. Because we are given this license to touch, um, I think that a connection is built with our clientele. And um, trust is built and the connection grows and confidence over time is built. And people stay with us in the salon sometimes years, sometimes generations. I know with David and his family, I've been seeing he and his wife and his girls for 15 plus years. And so the opportunity to really be with somebody through their whole life, um, through the ups and the downs and the health issues and, and such, um, I think that an informed stylist um, can use the opportunity that they have behind the chair to listen to their clientele and to find out what's really going on with them, um, to really observe and see what's happening on their skin, on their neck, on their scalp, and um, use that influence to help make a difference in people's lives. So through the connection that comes automatically with the position, we build trust, we gain confidence, we use our position to observe and to listen to our clients about their health, and we get educated, and because we care, that's why we're here today. So um, it's, in, it's great to be able to be part of this, and I think that all of us working together can help um, early detection because, like David said, that is the difference between saving lives and not. So thank you so much. And I think we'll move on to the um, demo part of the... All right. Is there a mouse that happens to be lurking there? Thank you. So there is a way that we, that I found is a great way to, um, to do the detection on your clientele. Are we there yet? Or? We are almost okay. there. So um, we found that using the blow dryer in the salon is the best way to get a great visual on the scalp. And in just a sec, we're going to see how that works. All right. Go. Thanks for coming in today. For the sure. I'm going to um, ask you, do you want to do a scalp check for melanoma today? Um, yeah. That, can you do that? That would be great. Yep, yeah, I can. And I'm also going to ask if you want your face and your neck to be looked at as well. Yeah, so... Um, that would be wonderful. Okay, great. So it's always important when you have your client in your chair to ask permission. 
to um, check their head, neck, and scalp. And I wouldn't see why anybody wouldn't want that done. Um, you know, one of the things you might want to do is have your receptionist. Um, well, actually, we'll talk about that in a sec. We're going to go with the video here. So really, really taking a dry, clean hair, taking a look at the hairline, and making sure that you check behind the ear. You're looking for anything that is new, hasn't been there before, sticking out um, in any way and getting your attention, and David will go through that later on, specifically what to look for. Um, we're gonna use a blow dryer on medium to high air, cool, to, as you can see, move the hair around in a very formulated manner. It gives the best visual of the scalp for the longest prolonged period of time. And um, I sectioned the hair off in four sections here, so I'm working in a small section, the one quadrant of the head. And, um, you know, there'll be different textures of hair you'll be working on. There'll be different thicknesses, curly hairs and such, they'll call for a different type of um, maybe use a brush to, go, to get through some thicker hair with the blow dryer. Um, we're going to see how you, you do the back of the hair as well. It's pretty much the same. Um, clean dry hair, you don't want product on the hair because oil um, could cause the hair to stick to the scalp. Well, you'll get the hang of this after a while. It's a, it's a really, um, you'll get the flow of it really once you start blowing the hair around a little bit. Short hair will be a little different. It may be that the hair is so short that the blow dryer won't blow it. In that case, you take the comb and you just sort of section little by little so you can get a really great visual. Um, this takes about three to five minutes, and um, you might want to ask the receptionist in your salon to talk to clients on their way out so that they can potentially book that time on their next appointment to come in and have you do it. You can, when clients call for appointments, you can ask them you know, and tell them, our salon has been educated on detection of early melanoma. Would you like a free scalp check? And that way, I know we're all busy in the salon. Those three to five minutes don't get you behind on your tight schedule. Um, and, yeah, it's a great way to add on a little bonus wellness service in the salon. You can even advertise that your, your stylists have been trained. So if you have any questions, I'll take them later on after the um, presentation. But that's, that's the way to check. Thank you. Thank you, Andrea. You're um, so interesting, it's, um, and I don't know how many uh, medical professionals are still on. Andrea and I have done this in conjunction with the chair of dermatology, Dr. Nancy Thomas, and after Nancy saw this the first time, she commented, well, that's how I was taught to examine hair as a resident. And so um, for the medical professionals, this is a actual medical way to do this as well, especially, uh, as Nancy pointed out, for patients with thick hair, male or female, is a very nice technique. So I want to now highlight what someone who has access should be looking for. Um, and I want to emphasize, I know that, that everyone has this idea of how serious melanoma is, but you can also do a service by picking up a basal cell. Uh, you know, I've got the estimates from skincancer.org for the 2017, 3.8 million basal cell carcinomas 
will be diagnosed in the United States this year. And the overwhelming majority are going to be in the head and neck. So stylists, barbers, they have access to this area and could easily pick something like that up. This is also a cutaneous squamous cell could be picked up, right? This, and I want to emphasize this, a cutaneous squamous cell has absolutely no relationship to tobacco. So this is a sun exposure problem. Um, and you can see there are going to be an estimate of 1 million cases. Um, and instead of a very, very rare death, there's going to be actually almost 9,000 predicted deaths from cutaneous squamous cells in the United States this year. So again, this has a predilection to sun-exposed area, head and neck, a prime candidate for cutaneous squamous cell carcinomas. And then the, the skin cancer that gets the most discussion because of its lethality is, is melanoma. So skincancer.org estimates there's going to be 146,000 new cases in 2017. The number of invasive melanomas will almost be at 90,000. And again, it's increasing per annum, as I've shown several different times. The non-spreading, and we'll discuss this in more detail, non-spreading type melanoma in situ is almost 60,000. And interestingly, the death rate is stable. And the death rate is stable um, for several different reasons, but the biggest being is that we're picking up a lot of early melanomas. So you can imagine that if we're picking up early melanomas that don't have as much of a lethal possibility, the death rate is going to be relatively stable. And that, that's what we're finding. So I want to make two distinctions. One, so even though this is in a, in a tough anatomic space, right, right over the zygomatic arch or the cheekbone, um, this actually is melanoma in situ. And this cannot, will not spread to lymph nodes or vital organs. It, it becomes a skin issue only. And, and in this lady... It's not trivial because of where it is anatomically, but she does not have any concern for her life. She, in a very nice way, has to worry about the scars from her wide excision and reconstruction. But this is not leading to a life-threatening issue. Whereas invasive melanoma can spread to the lymph nodes, can spread to vital organs, and so, therefore, has an impact on life, okay? So, this is where we would love to find these early, would love to find these, melanoma in situ, but this is the whole issue with early detection. Um, and so, I have a theme. It's going to continue throughout this whole talk. You find something early, you have a better prognosis. It it's, may sound very, very simplistic in melanoma, but it's true. The early detection, you get a better prognosis. And for those of you that are used to looking at um, charts like this, um, on the far left in the upper screen, if you see, here's the five-year survival rate for a T1A invasive melanoma. So this would be a melanoma that's very thin but crosses that threshold from in situ to invasive. You can see, you know, you've got a 99% five-year survival rate. You know, you're not going to get into trouble for a T1A melanoma. And then as you have thicker and thicker melanomas, but don't have any lymph node involvement, you can see how the prognosis starts dropping. Um, and so this is why, excuse me, um, and this is why we want to try to keep this 
detection in this range because of the outstanding survival. So I, I'm not sure how many people are going to um, participate, but I want you to look at these. Who, who who would do biopsies? Or how do we, as healthcare professionals, decide which ones of these to biopsy? You know, you could imagine that, um, and this is on the cheek, you know, you could imagine that this person is seen in the, the barber shop time after time. You know, it would have been very easy for someone to, to say to their client to do this. Or someone that has a nail care specialists in their office or that actually do this, this may be something you see in your office. A uh, massage therapist may be seeing this um, or this could be seen by, by anyone. So how do we make these kind of decisions? So there's the A, B, C, D, E's that have been um, proposed for healthcare professionals to decide um, whether or not to biopsy something. Started with the A, B, C, D, and E, evolution or change, has been added uh, most recently. So if the borders are irregular or asymmetric, um, there's multiple different colors and a diameter greater than six millimeters, those things factor in. And it's been shown that if you have two of the four of the first one plus evolution or change, that should mandate a biopsy from a healthcare professional. So, let's start in the top left, and Alan, if we can do this, who, who would biopsy the top left one? Do you have a way to do this, Tim? Uh, we do. If you'll pass me that keyboard for yeah. a moment, I'll yeah. go ahead and take us to our Poll Everywhere slides, yeah. and then we can go ahead and see that. So here we go. So I just want to remind you again that you can go ahead and text those questions. One time only you go, uh, you, you, you text the number 22333 with the letters UNCCN. That joins you, and then you can go ahead and share any questions you may have. Or in this case, and I'm sorry, questions, but in this case you're going to, to let Dr. Alila know which of those uh, you, would, you think would be uh, worthy of a biopsy. So while we're waiting for responses, uh, Andre is, is hitting me on the arm saying, you, you better biopsy that one, mm -hmm. right? So I, th I think, I think the, the top left one is actually very, very classic for a melanoma. It's got asymmetry, it's got irregular borders, it's got multiple different colors, it's got a diameter greater than six millimeters, uh, and there's been change. So, I mean, you, you couldn't ask for anything more on that one for a classic melanoma, okay? Yeah. Can I add something real quick? Just, you know, speaking to the beauty professionals, if you were to find something on a client, get your camera phone out, take a picture with your phone, and let them see what you're finding, and also keep it for your own resource and record to, so that you can check it next time they come and see if it's changed or grown or anything like that. It only takes a second, and it's, it's something you can do. And also keep a card or a number of dermatologists in your area that you can let them walk out the door with the phone number so that they're ready to call. So now let, let's, let's go to the bottom left, the, the back, right? And I, I've used a, a technique to blow that up. Um, would you biopsy either one of those? The bottom left, would you biopsy either one of those? And if so, which one? All right, so we've got a top left, and we've got some yeses. So, and yep. if you want to specify, going back there. What about the bottom left? Which one of those would you do? Or either one, neither? Well, so it's interesting. So someone is thinking, yeah, I'd biopsy all of them. And, and I couldn't, couldn't disagree. Um, but if we bring that up, so now, interestingly enough, everyone may have looked at this one going, man, 
I did, he just taught me irregular borders. You know, it's not symmetric. Look at this one. This is he's tricking me. This has got a perfectly round border. Maybe there's two colors, but it's it's symmetric. You know, clearly this is not bigger than six millimeters. This one's benign. This one's the invasive melanoma. So even Tim, can you advance that for me? So even for us as healthcare providers, um, one more Tim, please. You know, even this is not foolproof. And so you're sitting there saying, wow, you know, okay, you just tried to educate me on the ABCDEs of, of detection and who should we biopsy, and Andrea's already picked up. You got a phone, right? Well, we've got lots of things. I mean, you know, to get onto my phone, all I do is put my fingerprint on there. So there's a lot of intelligence out there about pattern recognition. And there's a lot of things about computer-aided recognition. And so why can't we do that for melanoma, right? So this is an FDA-approved product called Melafind, where there's a computer program. The dermatologist puts the, the wand on the left-hand side on the melanoma or on the pigmented lesion and ask the computer program to tell whether or not it should even be biopsied. And there was great buzz about this. And this product was on CBS News and on and on, and everyone touted that this was the end of the dermatologist. FDA w withdrew their approval. It's been found that there's fault, that the detection device misses melanomas. So for everyone who thinks that technology is going to get rid of the healthcare provider, here's a reason to pause. This is no substitute for an experienced dermatologist to recognize in biopsy. So, so take home message from the first part of this is stylus, and again, that can be interchanged with anyone who has access to a client with their skin, has, plays a vital role in early detection. Why? Can they can identify changing or suspicious lesions. And what to do? Get that patient or client to an experienced healthcare provider who knows how to biopsy. And again, the mantra, early detection, better prognosis. So with that, as a first part of our discussion, um, I'd like to take questions now. If anyone has any comments on Andrea's technique or the early detection of skin cancers. And again, if you have questions, you can just go ahead and text those. If you've already joined Poll Everywhere, you don't need to join again. You just go ahead and text your question, and we'll see those in just a moment. Here we go. So how did the Melafind fail finding melanomas? Uh, because um, the Melafind, right, it's some algorithm, right? You taught it to do it. It would actually tell dermatologists, when they put that on there, not to biopsy. And therefore, the patient would be sent out of the dermatologist's office with no biopsy performed on what eventually would be recognized as a melanoma. So that's why the FDA withdrew this. All right. Thank you. Should everyone see a dermatologist regularly? Right. So the beauty of that question is I am not a dermatologist, so I can tell you 100% there is no reason for everyone to go see a dermatologist. However, if you have pale skin, you've burned regularly, even when you think about going into the sun, you have numerous nevi, you may want to do that. Um, a regular dermatologist visit or an experienced family practitioner may be part and parcel of what you need to do. And then our next question is melanoma hereditary. 
very, very select. Um, there's one uh, gene that we know of, and it is only present in 1 to maybe 1.5% of people that have three blood relatives. So we don't even send these patients to um, the UNC genetics unless we have three blood relatives with, and I mean first degree relatives. Are there any other questions about this part of the, the talk? So the next question is, what about African Americans? Great question. Um, so the issues, the ABCDs are, and E's are all the same for African Americans, Asian Americans, Lumbee Indians, it's the same. You're, you're looking for the ABCDE, and, and I'm going to emphasize change again. It's the same. So it doesn't change. Here's the difference. African Americans, Asian Americans are more likely to get melanoma on the nails, palms, and soles. So those people need a little bit more diligent look. So maybe someone who has a nail practice, or maybe you know whether it's a, um, a podiatrist or whether it's a nail salon, those people have a better access of looking at the, at the nails, the hands, and, and maybe even the soles of the feet. Do you want to talk about the next one? Sure. How can you converse about your finding something on your client without giving them alarm? I mean, great question, especially if it's a first-time client. I think what I would do is, is just bring up that you have been um, trained, you have been educated in how to detect potential skin cancer, and that you see something that might that they might want to get looked at. I would diminish the idea that it is a deadly skin cancer, and, and but say that it is something that you've been trained to look at, and it does seem like in your uh, experience you would have that checked out. Um, anything to add to that? I mean, no, I think that's a, a very nice way to do it. I, I think the emphasis on change um, it may be hard if this is the first time you've been with a client, right? But I think if you've established a relationship over three visits or four visits, um, I think that's uh, very appropriate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the next question is, the hands and the feet and the nails are affected due to lack of melanin? We don't know. We, we don't really know what the mechanism is of why people who have a higher percentage of melanin and melanocytes in their skin, why that? Um, because th there probably are African Americans who have a higher ratio on their palms or soles than I do on my native skin. So we're not clear why those people do that. Um, should darkly pigmented people be advised to use sunscreen? Um, absolutely. Um, this, this does not, just because I'm highlighting the hands and the feet and the nails, they absolutely can get a melanoma on the deltoid just like I can get one on my shoulder. So the, absolutely um, should do that as well. All right. So a, as usual, I think I've made this talk too long because the questions are so good. Um, but I just want to give a little bit of highlight of the progress in the therapy for melanoma um, because these are going to be drugs you're hearing over and over in other cancers as well, and they all got their roots in melanoma. Um, so now let's shift to the bottom right. Um, so these are the people that have lymph node involvement, and you can see the more they have lymph node involvement, the worse their prognosis, okay? It's not to say that if it's in your lymph nodes, you can't survive, as, as shown by these two bar graphs, that you have uh, over 70 and over 60% five-year and 10-year survival. 
But look what happens if it gets into a vital organ, the lungs, the liver, the brain, right? That's where we're really having problems, and, and you could argue have a great room for improvement. So for those of you that don't like pictures like that, like this, you can close your eyes, but I wanted to emphasize to the audience that, right, lymph node involvement or metastases on the skin, or this is a, a CT scan of the lung, or metastasis here, or someone who's allowed their lymph node under their arm to get really big, right? These are the tough ones for us still. Um, and this is the ones where, uh, as you're looking at that previous, these are the people that are in these two. These are the tough actors and that we have and need progress. So if you go back from the time uh, that I was a fellow in, in 1996 all the way to 2010, th these are the only drugs we had. And you can see, you know, a response rate of 3 to 5%, you know, a drug that has no overall survival advantage. This was basically, you might as well have been taking sugar water or a placebo because this is not the kind of responses we want to see in drugs. But that all changed. And I'm not here to give you a complete primer on immunotherapy, but I, I want to highlight, and I think the last time th there was lots of questions, and I want to highlight two things. That, you know, you've got receptors on your white blood cell or your tumors, and these are the two that are getting the most buzz. A PD-1, or a CTLA-4 inhibitor. And these are the blockades, and I've got another cartoon to show you, that have really set the cancer world literally on fire because of the ability to harness the immune system and use it to the advantage in a therapeutic standpoint. So this is a little bit better, um, and this is where you can imagine you know, your immune system doesn't really know what to do yet. It doesn't really understand that it's got a cancer. Um, the white cells haven't been primed. So you basically come in here, and what this does is this stops the immune system. And so you can imagine if you come in with a drug that blocks or break the break, you can imagine that this immune system is just going to go wild. And that's what it does with this drug. CTLA-4 inhibitors just send the white cells skyrocketing. A more specific is getting to the binding of the white blood cells on the cancer cell, right? And so you can imagine that we've got lots of things that are trying to to compete for that. Well, we don't want that. We don't want anything competing. We want that white cell to go in there and bind to the cancer cell and kill it. So, so that's where the PD-1 inhibitor is going. This is the priming and this is the effector phase. So this is the first, and I, I've limited the number of, of truly medical, and, and this may not seem like a lot to you. These were incredibly heavily pretreated patients. And so four months may not seem like a lot, but in heavily treated patients that you can actually see a statistical difference, this is a, may not seem like a lot, but that's a big difference in our world. And especially now that it may meant that we actually had a drug that worked. And so this is the, the first trial that was published in 2010, um, FDA approved, given fast track status, and shown in 2011, and this is the CTLA-4 inhibitor. So we, we've got a drug now that actually has efficacy in our patients. Here's the response rate for the PD-1 inhibitors. Same thing. You can imagine, oh my gosh, things are rapid fire. Here's a 2012. And then what happens in medicine when you have two good things, you put them together. 
And so if you look at the CTLA-4 inhibitor over here versus the PD-1 inhibitor versus put them both together, I mean, look at this response rate. I could have never imagined having response rates of nearing 60% in melanoma patients. As a fellow, I could have never imagined that. And the interesting thing about this is that the median survival or the survival when half the patients are still alive versus half the patients are dead still hasn't been met. So the combination of both of these immune drugs together is, is an incredible advance in our field. So this is just a summary slide to show you the difference. Um, these are some targeted therapies to the BRAF pathway. Um, and then I've shown you, here's one of the PD-1 inhibitors, here's the second. And then this is just another way to show the response data, that we get an actual response of 57% in patients that can tolerate both drugs together. And so this is what's revolutionizing our care and management of the patient with vital organ involvement. So in summary, um, I think and I hope we've shown you in the first part of the talk that people that have access to people's skin can make a difference. Um, early detection leads to early pro better prognosis. Um, I've briefly shown you some of the dramatic improvement in therapy. So what now? You know, this is where people can start continuing the efforts of combinations, maybe adding radiation, maybe adding surgery, maybe adding a third immunotherapy. But this is now a landscape for those of us that think about how to treat these patients that we can actually imagine and dream of having response rates you know, in 60, 70, 80 percent. This was never imagined before. So with that, I would like to conclude and allow us another five to six minutes to be able to answer any additional questions that the audience has. Thank you for your time. Great. Thank you. Let me advance that so we can get to that poll everywhere again. And uh, we do hope that you'll go ahead and send even Oops, there we go. We, hope, we do hope that you'll get even more questions to us. These questions we've had so far have been terrific. Uh, so any other questions you have, please go ahead and, and send those in now. Uh, while we're waiting for those to come in, I do want to remind those who registered and are participating in the program today with, via GoWebinar, uh, within an hour or so uh, after the, the presentation, we'll go ahead and email out to you a uh, request for an evaluation. And then if you were hoping to get a uh, North Carolina Board of Cosmetics, Cosmetic Art Examiner's Certificate, you'll receive that after you filled out that evaluation. So uh, please be sure to do that and don't hesitate to contact us if you do have uh, any questions about that or anything else. Um, while we're waiting for any additional questions, the, the, the last question, I think, uh, about should darkly pigmented people be advised to use sin sunscreen, that's sometimes a, a myth that's out there that if you have a darker complexion, you, you don't need sunscreen, and you do. Are there other myths floating around there around melanoma that might be useful to address? Yeah. Um, the other, my, my other favorite myth mm -hmm. is, is the, um, quote, need for a base tan end quote. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There could be nothing more, <laughs> right? If you are a Caucasian and you have brown skin, that is damaged skin. Mm -hmm. There is no such thing as a base tan, right? You know, embrace. that If you're pale, embrace being pale. I mean, it's, that's how you are supposed to be. Or there are, because yes. people do like to be brown, but there are alternative ways yes. now with um, spray tanning, healthy yes. skin lotions that have pigment in them, which is just, you know, going on the, the dermal layer and um, bronzer. Yes. <laughs> um, yeah. yeah, there are alternative ways. And if you are doing that, look for more natural and organic versions of that if you can, because then that gets into a whole nother level of toxin. But, um, all right. So the next question is, do you only need to be checked 
for an area that's been exposed to the radiating sunlight? And the answer to that is no. Because what your body has been primed is that it could make a melanoma anywhere because that radiating UV rays have primed your body. So just because you've had a blistering sunburn you know, on your chest because you forgot to put sunscreen there, that doesn't mean that your arms and legs couldn't get it as well. All right. And we have a thank you in there at, at the end. Uh, we do want to, uh, before we close, uh, first off, thank both of you, David, Andrea, thank, thank you. you both. Thank this you. has been terrific. Uh, I hope that our audience has learned a lot and we've appreciated the questions they've had. Uh, this presentation, along with all of our other presentations, will be available online. This will be available in just a couple of days, so if there's something you want to go back and review, if you want to find the slides, if you would like to uh, share this with others, all of that's available at our site at UNCCN. Uh, as always, we want to thank the UNC Lineberger Comprehensive Cancer Center, and we want to thank the University Cancer Research Fund, also known as UCRF, and the, the state legislature for their generous support of, of this work. We want to thank Mary King, Veneranda Oborre, and Alan Brown on our team for all the hard work they do to make this possible. Uh, coming up next, uh, next month, we have Understanding and Living with Chemo Brain with Dr. Carla Thompson. Dr. Thompson has been with us before. She's a great speaker, and there's a lot to learn about Chemo Brain, so uh, we hope you'll join us for that on June 30th at noon. Uh, if you have any other questions, uncccn at unc.edu or 919-445-1000. Uh, we're easy to find, uncn.org. We hope you'll visit us there, and we look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks so much.